Welcome to the Author's Porch, where every good conversation happens. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride from author to author. We want to give you an experience where you learn and enjoy the conversation. Authors tell you about their journey, you learn about new books, and at the end of the day, you go home with a smile on your face because the Author's Porch is a beacon of light bringing you home to the family you never knew you had. We hope that you enjoy the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Author's Porch, where every great conversation happens. And it happens because we trusted Brendan and Bomzi at Master Talk to show us the power of effective communication. We also make sure we have a great cup of coffee from Third Day Coffee Seguin, a Christ-centered, veteran-owned coffee company. Today on the show, we have Jeff Lucas. How are you doing, Jeff? Great. Nice to be here. Yeah, it's so great to have you. We were talking a little bit before we came live, and guys, we're going to have a great time today because Jeff is a jokester, and <laughs> and we were already laughing, so we've already connected, and we're going to have a great time. But before we go into just cutting up and laughing and learning all the wonderful things that Jeff is doing in writing in his books. I want to give you guys a little bit of a background. So from a high school championship coach to teaching at a university, Jeff Lucas is no stranger to success. When his life changed by a chance encounter at the age of 12, he took that memory with him through life and and it became the center of his book, The Lost ship. When Jeff decided to write his book, he did extensive research and consulted with a marine biologist for facts and accuracy. A portion of his book's proceeds will be donate, donated to the Nature Conservancy. Did I say that right? Conservancy? You got it. You got <laughs> I do it. try. I do try. <laughs> Their mission is to conserve the lands and waters throughout the world. I commend you for that, Jeff, because one of the things you were telling me before we went live is all the different species and things that are in your book. So and I bet that that is one of the things that was probably maybe the funnest part of writing, but I'm going to let you tell us that. <laughs> Ask away. <laughs> yeah. So, this chance encounter at the age of 12, I'm really, I, I don't know if it's a spoiler alert as part of the book, but when I heard that, I was like, oh, interesting. Well, I actually can, I don't know if this will work or not, but I pulled this up okay. and can you, can you see, can you see that, that, can you, whoops, let me see. Well, okay, sorry. That's a, that's a 12 year old kid namely me, I can't even focus it on that. Well, you can't see it. Anyway, I'm sit, I'm standing there with my bathing suit on and an uh -huh. octopus on my chest. No way. And we used to vacation in Hawaii and my dad would hire the locals to take me out spearfishing. And I wasn't any good at it, but of course they were fishing for dinner and they would bring home fish for dinner and not unusually they would spear an octopus. And later I found out how smart they were and how clever and fun and even playful. And so that was kind of the spark for the book. Oh, I, you know, I heard that they're kind of pranksters themselves. Well, they're very good at disguise. Oh, and, okay. oh yeah. And of course they slip around. I mean, there, there are a couple of, good stories. One, one, I talked to a guy who was, uh, he was, he was the gentleman who figured out how to allow the dolphins to escape the nets. He actually dived into one of those, they have the two ships and the net in between. And yeah. he dived into it to figure it out. And of course they've done it. Now the dolphins can escape. I don't know how. Wow. And he was telling me one time he was out here in Puget Sound, which is outside of Seattle. Mm -hmm. And he was doing a, a uh, assay of crabs and the octopus kept bugging him because he wanted one of the crabs. It's a big octopus. <laughs> so he picked it up, 
took it over yonder, set it back down. The next thing he knew, the octopus reared up in front of him and gave him a dirty look. Oh, my God. So by that time, he was kind of finished. So he said, OK, I got it. You want one of these? So he grabbed a crab, picked up the octopus, took it over yonder, and that was all it took. <laughs> I could imagine. So they found a way somehow to communicate versus just be threatened or frightened. They're like, well, you know, I'm I'm kind of big like you, uh -huh. the octopuses, and I'm going to find a way to communicate with you. Uh -huh. And at 12 years old, that didn't frighten you? The octopus? Yeah. Well, they were small. Oh, you know, okay. we, were, we were skin diving. We weren't diving. You know, we were diving 10 or 15 feet. To, oh. And of course, those guys would go and grab a hold of the rock and stick their head in. And I wasn't going to do that. You know, and the fish weren't just swimming around to be speared. You know, you had to go into the hole. So I wasn't too good at it. But uh, wow. No, the octopuses didn't scare me. At that point. Now, at 12 years old, did you ever think of writing about that octopus? What was the. Uh... Absolutely not. I mean, I, yeah. I've always been kind of creative. Uh -huh. I just did. I Can I tell you a funny story about my book yeah. tour? Please. Okay. I went to El pa I, I had a gentleman contribute $10,000 to the El Paso School District with the proviso that they would buy 400 of my books. And then they wow. invited me down and they were asking me and I said, well, I've always been creative. And, you know, I was a, I used to be a perfectionist. So I said, but now I'm in the DSM. So I'm certifiably mentally ill. And one of the little gals in the back said, raised her hand and she said, well, well, did writing the book help you with your mental illness? <laughs> <laughs> did you tell her, no, it may, may have uh, gave me some of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That, that's interesting. You, um, God, you know, I watched a documentary about octopuses one time and they're actually... I don't know if I think it was Iceland. I get Iceland and Greenland mixed up, but okay. there's a guy who um, actually dives and and he he swims with them, and he has like a friend, and he's made friends with this one. And was it my octopus teacher? I, it, I, I, it may have been, but like they actually, he goes and he visits it, like sure. over yeah, I and think over. That's what it was, yeah. They're, they're fascinating creatures. So you talk about more than just the octopus in the book, though, correct? Well, sure. I mean, the, the kid's father is a professional diver working on a way to talk underwater. Mm. And he loses one of the devices overboard. And the octopus slips away with it and learns to talk. And then the kid goes out to shoot a photo of the octopus for a class project. And, of course, he can't believe it. But he buys in. And then when the octopus, when, then when they were chatting, the octopus allowed that when he'd come out of the plankton, he had seen an old sailing ship intact mm -hmm. and the kid decides that it would be the greatest maritime discovery in history. So they hit across the reef to find it. So that's essentially the, the conceit. Wow. Could you imagine them talking? Well, what do you think one you would know, say? I'd love to be silly. And there was <laughs> lots of banter. There was lots of giving crap in both directions by both of them. <laughs> oh, man. You know, one of the things I learned as I was writing it that I, I hadn't really expected or imagined, and that is that when Jack is the kid, when he's by himself, he's pretty smart. I mean, he knows he's dived before and he knows the creatures and all that. But as soon as he gets with Armstrong, the octopus, he gets pretty dumb because the octopus has to explain everything about the ocean to him. And so that was a little bit of a surprise to me that he would go from, you know, smart to dumb back to smart again. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Did you, was the octopus kind of like, um, I mean, how do I say this? When he, he was teaching him the stuff about the ocean, was that basically like the, the research part that you learned from the marine biologists at that point, did the octopus take, take on the marine biologists kind of teaching you about the ocean? Well, of course, in a very sort of casual um, conversational way, I guess right. I say. a lot of it was confronting the creatures themselves. Oh, and so, and, and actually, you know, the marine, it was funny because marine biologists specialize Yeah. and I'm not a marine biologist, but I have pretty broad 
knowledge because I did all the research. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it came, of course, there was a lot of, I, you know, five or six books on sharks and on marine mammals and all that. But a lot of it came from dive magazines because mm -hmm. those are the guys that actually experienced what happened. So, for example, I read an article about a guy who'd seen a manta ray with ropes fraying and digging into its shoulders from a from a net and six what used to be floats but were now jugs full of water beating on its belly it couldn't even swim straight and so he and of course they're very gentle they're so big that they hardly have any predators and so he cut off you know he got out his dive knife and cut off the ropes and cut off the jugs and I, I took that right out of that article, and that's exact, exactly what Jack does. <laughs> oh, so, wow. So it's pretty realistic in a lot of ways. Yeah, that's fascinating. I, I think the, the ocean is one of the things that most humans don't explore, and we don't know enough about because it's this great unknown, this dark scary yeah. thing i mean me i'm i'm afraid of deep water i'll be oh, the first to admit it if if i get anywhere that something touches my toes i'm out I like, see. I, i'm a big i'm a big fraidy cat so I I, yeah but you read about so many things you know that happens to yeah. the creatures well, in the ocean. Here. we're up uh, here and everything else is down there i mean yeah. unless you go down and join them have you heard of the harem fish no uh -uh. well it's a it's a male that has 16 or 18 females that it herds around and protects. And of course it fathers all the children. Yeah. So what happens when it dies? <sighs> One of the females turns into a male and takes over. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you see people my say, face? I was like, <gasps> yeah, people say, is that true? <laughs> yeah, it's true. So wow. there's a lot of, there's a lot of good stuff down there. Yeah. I think it's the fear of the unknown for a lot of people. And because it's not our natural environment as far as breathing. Exactly. It is yeah. not. Right. Yeah. Not. Wow. So, That's so I, fascinating. I had a blast. You know, it was, uh, it, the research was pretty laborious, but once I had it gathered, I mean, I had a notebook of eight and a half by 11 that was that thick. Oh, I can imagine. And then I had to put it in an order. I wanted to get everything in that was interesting and I had to put it in an order. So it took me an entire four years to outline the book because you have to have make smooth transitions. Yeah. I mean, so he's doing one thing and then he reaches down and he gets electrocuted by the torpedo ray, et cetera. And so, but once I had the outline, oh boy, did I have fun. <laughs> wow. I, there's just, there's so much that you could use, right? There's, oh, 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 there's so oh yeah, there is. I mean, in fact, it was almost, well, some of the things, I mean, I, I picked out names that I thought were pretty, I mean, like Venus flower basket and mermaid's veil and yeah. dead man's fingers well yeah. those are all sponges but i really liked the terms and mm -hmm. so i had to figure out a way to get them in which i did i mean as he you know as armstrong is giving the kid directions on how to get to the certain place uh, how to get out of the the den etc he says well you go by the venus flower ba basket and then the kid has to ask him what it is and then it's the mermaid's <laughs> veil. Well, what's that? You know, and he finally decides, well, I can probably figure out what the dead man's fingers are. <laughs> this sounds like a movie more than it does a book. I that's that's the greatest thing about it, because I I'm visualizing it as you're as you're telling it to me, I can visualize them going around certain parts of it. I think that's the best thing about books when you can my dogs are having a little fit over there. They join oh. every show, by the way. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -oh. So uh, the best thing about a book is when I'm not reading it, you're telling me about it, but uh -huh. when, when you are hearing about it or reading it and you can, it's like you're watching it happen before your eyes. And mm -hmm. I'm watching these characters going around these sponges in this ocean oh. You know, as you're telling me about it, I, well, I love there, that. There's a lot of action. Let me tell you. I mean, it's one action <laughs> right after another. <laughs> so oh. I, I did a, uh, I had a, I commissioned. I don't, I've never heard of any other author that's ever done it, but I commissioned a research company to recruit 12 kids, half boys, half girls, third through sixth grade, and to to get their their ideas, and uh, and. They, one of the things that they, they wanted more. 
So they wanted to know more about Jack, more about his buddies, what he did, all that kind of stuff. And they wanted one more big episode in the middle. And there was one thing I'd wanted to do, but I hadn't, I, I could get the problem started, but I couldn't figure out how they could solve it. And I finally figured it out. And so I gave it to him. I gave him one more episode in the middle. That's, that's pretty fun. Yeah. That's really smart. To, is your book primarily geared towards kids or is it oh, geared sure. toward? Okay. So it's, oh, yeah, it's upper it's grade. Okay. Yeah. A lot of people don't think about if you're going to gear it towards a specific audience, get that audience to, to tell you what, what they want. Mm -hmm. They just usually write what they think the audience wants to see. Well, I was really happy to get their, their feedback. And yeah. one of the, they were pretty smart. I mean, one of the kids said, well, I'm going to save my 25 bucks and buy the book when it comes out. And the other kid said it was the second best book I ever read. They're all readers. Oh. And the third one was really smart. He said, adventure, laughs and facts. I like that in a book. <laughs> oh, wow. Man, that's an adult review right there. Yeah, exactly. In three words. Yeah. yeah. That's when you put on like your, your promo sheets. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, that's something out of New York times. You know yeah. what I mean? Like that kid should be writing for him later on. <laughs> I did. I did get, I did spend one, the, the gentleman in El Paso, has a granddaughter and she read it and he, she said, he said, I, I can't, I don't think he paid them, but he said, I'm going to give you this book, but I want you to write a review. And the last line of her review was so good that I put it on the back cover. Oh, bless. <laughs> Leah at age 10. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the, I mean, if your book is geared towards them, it only makes sense that those are going to be the reviews that you want. Sure. Um, I mean, you can get them from, you know, New York Times, you can get them from USA Today or all of the big stuff. I mean, obviously everybody wants the big stuff, but I mean, I, I've, I've written a couple children's books, smaller ones, but I mean, if a kid reads it and a kid resonates with it and that's who your target uh -huh. audience is, that's, uh -huh. it's like you've done it, you know, that's what gets you right here. And that's, I think what every writer wants is to, to hit at the heart of the audience that you're gearing towards. Can I, to me, can that's I, when you've arrived, right? Can, can I tell you my favorite? Yeah. It's the little gal all dolled up and her mother was helping us in our house. And I she didn't have anything to do. So I said, well, here, why don't you read this? And I only had written 35 pages or 40 pages at that time. So she lay down, read for 20 minutes, got up, walked away. I thought, well, that didn't go over. Pretty soon she's <laughs> back on the floor. And then I found out later from her mother, she read the whole thing from her mother that she's mildly dyslexic doesn't like to read oh. and as soon as she got home she told her mother's boyfriend all about it the octopus did this the octopus did that etc <laughs> that's my oh. favorite I mean, yeah i like to read yeah that's when you could touch somebody that way that's very special thank you yeah that is yeah. very special that that'll go with you for a lifetime I, so, oh, yeah, I won't forget that. You say you went on a book tour. Where all yeah. did your book tour take you? Well, it was El Paso. Mm -hmm. Have you been there? I have, yeah, because, oh, yeah. yeah, I've been, yeah, I was stationed in Alamogordo, and we would have to go to El Paso to get to the airport. So oh, okay. uh, I was there okay. quite a and we would pass through there to get here to Brownsville. So, yeah. So you know how the environment is. Lots of freeways, lots of distribution centers. Oh, my not, goodness. Not oh, else. my goodness. Yes, it is very hard to drive through there. Do not get there through rush hour. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I visited 10 schools in three days, both elementary and middle school. And I had a PowerPoint presentation. And, you know, I felt a little bit like a dancing monkey because I was doing the same thing over again and doing a lot of dancing around and gesticulating and all of that. But they all seemed to be interested. They had banners and they had big posters. And and one there was one grade school. It was all, all the schools were in the poor district of El Paso. That was kind of prescribed. And so one school had 1,300 kids at, at a grade school, which I was stunned by. 
And so I had one entire fifth grade class of 130 kids and they were all wearing octopus masks. <gasps> oh my goodness. <laughs> so it was pretty fun. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to go hang out with those kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I want an octopus mask. Me. You know, it was, yeah, it was pretty good. They wanted me to sign this and that. I, I signed a couple of pairs of shoes. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. I thought only I thought only basketball players did that. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't easy, I'll tell you. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So man, octopus masks. I want an octopus mask huh. now. Like where did they get those? <laughs> yeah, I don't know because they were colored too. You know, yeah. Colored yeah. That's super cool. Right. Now are you going on a book tour anywhere else? Do you have anything else scheduled? Well, I may do something locally. Uh -huh. Um but no immediate plans. Oh, okay. I, and I'm not exactly sure how it would work to tell you the truth. I mean, I have a publicist and yeah, she, that's what she does for a living. And so yeah. she had said, you know, she could, I, I think I have to learn something about the local school district and then she'll take it from there. Mm. So yeah, they're very good at what they do. Yes. They, they figure that out and then they just say, okay, you go here on this day and you do this and then you, Absolutely. you show up. Yeah, that's the, <laughs> that's the, best, that's the <laughs> best part about it, right? The only funny thing was that the original schedule got changed all around for testing that week. Oh, yeah. And so twice I was dropped off at the wrong school. <laughs> oh, my. It oh, didn't my. matter because the other school was close, you know, and I eventually worked my way back to that school, but they had to rearrange things a little bit. So, yeah, man, but it was pretty fun. So you went from having an encounter, an encounter with an octopus at 12 years old. Right. Then you, you were a, a coach, a volleyball coach, volleyball. I got that right. correct. Right. Yep. Yep. And, and you took them to a state championship, the only right. one the school had ever had uh, right. out of any sport, correct? Agreed. And then you were a professor in a college? Well, sort of. I mean, I, <laughs> I you know, I, I've written short, what I call short line pieces all my life. So they look like poems, but they tell a story, have a beginning, middle and an end, and a pause at the end of the line. And they are easy to read but not simple. And so I written about 150 and 200. Well, in the meantime, I thought I was curious. I'm, I have a very big curiosity, I guess I would say. And I was curious about teaching. And so I got the community college professor to give me a class in poetry, no nonsense. So I taught a couple there. Then I went to the University of Washington. They laughed me out of the English department. And I talked to the uh, gentleman history professor just an absolutely wonderful guy who was the head of the interdisciplinary and honors program and so he gave me a class in the honors program so his so professor is a little strong but yeah i did teach it in the honors program at the university of washington <laughs> that's cool and then you go on to write uh this book which uh -huh. is fantastic and do a book tour in el paso and which you'll be doing more book tours. I'm sure your publicist to have you on those. Uh -huh. So what does it look like for the future for, for Jeff Lucas? What? A well, I'm going to write a memoir. I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't have, since the, the lined pieces that I write are so much different in flavor. I had the gentleman, the poetry editor at the Atlantic, and I had a contact, an agent who sent me to him, and he wrote back there once too light and not light, light enough. And so I didn't have any luck submitting them. And so what I'm planning on doing is writing a memoir about that. Also, I have a chap, we'll have a chapter in there defining art, which nobody has been able to do. I mean, Plato and Aristotle and Hegel and Schopenhauer and Hume and Rodin, they all, they all basically failed in my opinion. Mm -hmm. so I've got, and that's what I've been working on for the last month or so, because that's hard to, to define art. That's a hard thing to do. I mean, a yeah. lot of people they say you can never do it. So there'll be that. And then I put together an outline that I called considering the poem, which is a strunken white for poetry. Mm. And so it's a two page, very 
accessible, easy to read, easy to understand. And, um, and so that'll be part of it. And then the rest will be uh, my pieces. Wow. So you're going to put those all together in, yes. in one book for, right. for publishing? I, I, I've gathered them by chapters, you know, oh, encounters okay. and athletics and love and all of that. Do you think you'll write another children's book? You know, one of the people that I associated with who writes thrillers, and he's a publicist. I mean, in effect, he was hired by my publicist. And he's been encouraging me. And I've been thinking about it. I, I kind of wonder. I've been trying to figure out a signing gorilla in the jungle. I haven't quite figured out what the quest would be yet. But I thought, I mean, I did have so much fun doing it that, you know, it wouldn't have to be everything. I mean, there isn't as much in the jungle really as there is underwater to True. work with. And my my kid's book is pretty long. I mean, it's 230 pages. Wow, so yeah. I could shorten it down to 100 pages. And I, I might take a shot at it, CJ. Yeah. I mean, if you've gotten such rave reviews over the one that you have, and, and it doesn't even have to be shortened down because, I mean, if you look at some of the um, – books out there for the middle middle grade um you know you've got what harry potter i mean right. that that wasn't a small book in any way yeah. shape or form so right. right i mean there's no rule saying that has to be short unless right. you want it to be well it would only be i would only be limited by the creatures that they would encounter encounter in the jungle yeah you know, that and the storyline right i mean yeah. if depending on what what adventure they go on in the jungle I've got to figure it out. I've thought about yeah. kidnapping. The idea of going after a golden city sounds a little far-fetched for my taste. <laughs> I like it to at least pretend to be realistic. So, Well, you could, you know, go to what you, you asked me as a question when we first started. You, you asked about the average rainfall in the Amazon rainforest. You could... <laughs> You could, you know, go, you could make it, you know, the creatures in the Amazon rainforest. They may have more creatures than most, right. most jungles. So well, I I mean, there, there's an idea. You know, the, the, the kids book that I were talking about, uh -huh. I used creatures from all over the world. I mean, they don't all exist in one place. Okay. Yeah. There you go. I wanted all the creatures. In fact, there's even, they even go from temperate, which is he gets wrapped up in the kelp, you know, and the mm -hmm. wolf eel shows up and all of that. And that was too good of an episode for me to pass up, but that's temperate. Almost everything else is tropical, but yeah. I, I have a little preface that allows that that's what I've done. So, well, that's cool because then you could use jungles all over the world. Absolutely. In that one I book. Use all different yeah. people. Yeah, exactly. And it's such a teaching moment. And I think I read on your website that somebody said they wanted to use your book in their curriculum. Yes. I've had a couple of people say that. That's so cool. Well, That's you know, it's, cool. it's pretty easy to read. I mean, it's pretty smooth. You, you, you get the information, but it's not like getting it crammed down your throat. You know, it's just yeah. part of the story. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's important, you know, when you, I think that authors have a couple of the things that they should do when they're writing for children. One, you have a responsibility to understand your audience that you're writing for because it's children <laughs> right. and and it's a very important demographic. Uh -huh. um, and you can write for fun. You can absolutely write for fun because children's right. minds need to have fun because uh -huh. creative play is such an important part of them growing up, but you can also teach, right? Because them learning things that they would never learn anywhere else because a lot of that they don't learn in school unless they go sure. down that exact career path right. and but in a fun way they, okay. they learn it for a lifetime and then it's all because of a book they read as a child it's right. it's such an amazing amazing thing and, and the ocean is quite an unknown as you have suggested i mean yeah. people don't know the stuff that goes on down there i mean I, here's another little example that tickles me you know they're all portly terms whatever they, you know portly therms which means that they adjust their body to and yet I read in a dive magazine that he went by this underwater smoker, hot smoker coming out of the earth. Mm. And there was a grouper taking a hot tub 
<laughs> just kind of lounging above the hot smoker. <laughs> That'd be me. Yeah. That would be me. Right. I'd be like, it's cold down here. Where's the warmth? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> That's my favorite part. I, uh, I promise. I'm going to be excited when I get to that part. Okay. I like that. Says, well, you know, even Poik's like it warm. <laughs> I love that. If you had any advice to give to anybody out there that wants to write either a children's book or something like you did, take a childhood memory that just stuck with them throughout their whole life, what uh -huh. would your advice be? Well, first, probably be in the DMS, D, DSM. That, that'll that help. Be certified to yes. be mentally ill. That helps. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I'm not really sure because I'm not the typical book writer that mm -hmm. pumps out a book every year yeah. or every two years. Um, this was a project that seemed to me had to be done and took mm. years and years. I mean, I started at CJ in 1986. That mm. was when I started my research. So whatever I, I mean, I, I guess I would say enjoy word. I, I, I don't, I read a lot and I never go by a word that I don't know without looking it up. I mean, so that might be it. I mean, that's, that's great advice. The more words that you have there available, the better it allows you to be it seems to me yeah do your research yep very smart where can people reach you at jeff uh jeff lucas author.com and the web student's website is way cooler than me it was, <laughs> it was built for me by a pro and there's a lot of fun i mean even the website is fun there's pictures of the creatures and and there's some some videos of octopuses being smart you know getting out of bags, you know, that has a zipper on and all that kind of stuff. So it's pretty fun too. I can <laughs> attest to that. I did, I did creep on your website before okay. I, we came on the show. Yeah. I try to, if I get an author's website, I do try to go and check out the website to get a little more background sure. and understand the author more before I do an interview, because I think uh -huh. it makes for a better conversation. Um, so I did look at your website and I was like, Oh, there's some really cool stuff on here. Look at these yeah. pictures. Yeah. So Thank I you. did, I did go and take a look at that. So I can attest okay. to that. It Thank is you. a very cool website. Go check that out. We also put it in the uh, comment section here. So if you're on Facebook, Facebook or YouTube, you can check out the website just by clicking on the link. Or if you're listening to it on the podcast, which will be up in a couple days after the live here, it's Jeff, J-E-F-F-L-U-C-A-S-A-U-T-H-O-R.com. So we've come to the part of the show where we're going to be saying our goodbyes, but that doesn't mean that we'll never have a conversation again, because you never know when our paths are going to cross. But is there anything that we didn't bring up on the show that you want to make sure that your audience and listeners know about your book or yourself, Jeff? Well, not particularly. I mean, as I, I said, when we were chatting earlier, though, you know, I don't ask adults to read it because I consider that to be an imposition. I have no problem with the kids. And I would also say to the adult, if you read it to your kid, both of you will have fun. That's, That's about awesome. It. Thank you. Guys, go and check out Jeff's book. Head over to his website. Um, learn more about octopuses in the world below the ocean, if you dare. Um, me, I'm going to stay up here. I'm going to learn about it, but I'm not going to touch the fish. <laughs> not touching no fishies okay uh, <laughs> jeff i've had a great time uh having this conversation Thanks. with you thank you so much for coming on the author's porch and i look forward to reading the lost ship and possibly the jungle book not uh, to say the actual jungle book but the book sure. about the jungle that you right. may write later on there got make it. sure we okay. got that Right. right, because that is copyrighted for the people who wrote the actual Jungle yeah, Book. Right, right. <laughs> exactly. Oh, so guys, make sure that you come back every day that we have a show. And watch us either live or on the podcast right here on Facebook. You can ask Alexa or Siri to play the latest episode. Head to our website and catch the latest issue of the magazine that came out in January because April 4th, we have issue number four coming out. We want to continue making dream authors' dreams come true by providing them a platform to shine. We will see you guys next time. And if you appreciate conversations like we do and you want to become a better speaker, make sure you visit our friends Brendan and Bomsey at mastertalk.ca where they teach you the power of your voice. Don't forget to stay awake with a nice cup of coffee from Third Day Coffee Seguin, the best cup of coffee on this side of heaven. That's Third Day 
coffeesegain.com. And until next time, my friends, I'm CJ. There is Jeff. Go read his book and write on. Bye, Jeff. Bye, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. We'll Pleasure. See you later. Bye. Bye. The Author's Court is a certified veteran hosted podcast. Show your support. Tune in, share, and subscribe.